you have your Bibles, perhaps we can open them together in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, and we're in chapter number one. Ephesians and chapter number one. Good. So Ephesians chapter one, and uh, we'll break into the chapter there, uh, verse number 12. Verse number 12 of Ephesians chapter one which says <clears throat> that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love to all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And maybe just a little reminder back there in Genesis 24. You remember that picture that we noticed uh, concerning uh, Rebecca? and the unnamed servant. And do you remember that the task that that unnamed servant had was to bring Rebecca uh, from Haran or um, out of the Chaldees and bring her back to Canaan and that he had to give her something that was a token, perhaps, a, a promise uh, of what was to come. And uh, you'll, you have a part of that promise there in Genesis 24 and verse number 22 as uh, the unnamed servant meets Rebecca at the well. And verse 22 says, And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold. And perhaps you remember last time that we kind of transferred that into ounces. So your shekel's about half an ounce. So you've got roughly about five ounces of gold and in current value that's worth about £8,000. So that wasn't a bad tip for getting some water. And I reminded, we reminded ourselves as well that as the unnamed servant came to find a bride that he had ten camels loads behind him. So that was just a token of what he had and that in fact was really a token of what Abraham had. And of course as a... Uh, uh, as the unnamed servant is invited along to the home, of course, he would remind them, uh, verse 35, Genesis 25, Genesis 24, And the Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he's given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants, maid servants, camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master, and when she was old, and unto him has he given all that he hath. So he's really promising her this great inheritance. And that is just a little token. It's just a little, uh, can I use the word engagement ring? I'm going to try and justify that uh, later on. Just a little token of the inheritance that is there for Rebecca. Let's just ask for God's help, shall we? <clears throat> our Father, we do come into thy presence, our Father. Uh, this evening, we thank thee again for thy word. Uh, we pray, Father, for help. Uh, this this evening, uh, I noticed our Father uh, the subject matter before us and how much help we need. Uh, we know, Father, that there is much in these verses and uh, truth in it that is even beyond us, and uh, truth in it perhaps that we've never discovered. And so we ask, Father, for that little that we have gleaned that we might be given help just to enjoy and to share uh, that which we have uh, gleaned from the Word of God. We know, Father, that there's much in the Scriptures to encourage, and particularly in these verses that we've read, the encouragement of Father to press on to an inheritance. And uh, we ask, Father, that we might uh, be given the strength uh, to do that, and the help that we need. It's a long way from earth to heaven. It's a long way from time into eternity. It's a long way, Father, from redemption to redemption. And we pray, Father, uh, that we might rest in thy spirit as we make that journey. So be with us, our Father, we pray, as we ask for that help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
So as uh, I was uh, reading through this uh, little section in Ephesians, uh, I came to a subject and I thought, well, maybe we should perhaps just think a little bit about this subject. It is the subject of the Holy Spirit uh, there in verse number 13. And in fact, if you were to read through the whole of Ephesians, you would find quite a bit about the Holy Spirit. We might come back to that uh, later on. But uh, as I had thought a little bit about that subject of the Holy Spirit, I was somewhat discouraged because... It's such a vast subject. As you might remember, I'm sure, as you know, if you just think through your, uh, those little grey cells and you think of all the things in the Word of God that are said about the Holy Spirit, it really becomes somewhat unmanageable, almost bamboozling. Uh, as you remember that the, the Holy Spirit was involved in creation. Remember that way back in Genesis 1, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then he was involved in the inspiration of Scripture. Do you remember that from Second Peter, that the men of God in days gone by were moved by the Holy Spirit? He was involved too in the incarnation of the Lord Jesus. It's Luke that tells us uh, that uh, promise that was given, that the Spirit of God would come uh, upon Mary, the incarnation of the Lord Jesus uh, there uh, was dependent upon the work of the Holy Spirit. So too, in a sense, the ministry of the Lord Jesus as the Holy Spirit descends upon him. The gifts of the, the church in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get dizzy. Uh, and then you've got the work of regeneration and salvation. Do you remember the uh, ministry of the Lord Jesus to Nicodemus that he had to be born of water and of the Spirit. And do you remember too that it is the Spirit that we're dependent upon for conviction of sin, uh, uh, righteousness and judgment to come. Lord Jesus speaks about that in John's Gospel as well. And of course it's the Spirit of God in 1 Corinthians 6 who is responsible for sanctification. And it's the Spirit of God that brings fruit in your life and mine. And it's the Spirit of God in 2 Corinthians who brings about the transformation of the believer to reflect something of the image of God. Well, I just thought about that for a moment and I thought that's way too much. There's no way we can ever possibly even just uh, scratch that. And that's just, uh, just the, 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 those aspects of the Spirit of God that came to my mind. And of course, there's a lot more than that in the Word of God. Of course, the problem uh, with thinking about the great subject of the Holy Spirit is this, that as we think about the subject of the Holy Spirit, we're really thinking about God. We're thinking about God. And that, of course, is a subject that goes way beyond our ability just to systemize or put it into boxes or just to, 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 to be able to bring it all and fit it into our, our, our minds. It is uh, so vast a subject, uh, the work of God. However, uh, I, I do have a little bit of redemption here in Ephesians, uh, literally a bit of redemption, because in the Ephesian epistle, uh, when, it's, when we, re we read of the Spirit of God here in verse number 13, uh, we have a bit, a bit more of a focused view of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we don't have to necessarily consider all of those tremendously interesting subjects that uh, the Spirit of God uh, uh, has uh, as part and parcel of his ministry. But in the book of Ephesians, we really have a, a more focused view of the Holy Spirit. And I wanted to think a little bit uh, about that this evening with you. It is, in a, in a sense, a, a ministry of the Spirit of God that uh, has a beginning and an end, if you like. It's kind of bookended. Uh, it's very, very focused. And the ministry of the Spirit of God in the book of Ephesians runs from two points. And you'll read about those two points in verse 7 of Ephesians 1. And maybe you can see that there's something a bit strange in what we'll read, and we'll try and explain it in a minute. Ephesians 1 verse 7, "...in whom we have redemption through his blood." the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So if I was to ask you, are you redeemed? You, 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 I'm sure you would tell me, yes, I am redeemed. And you would perhaps go to Romans 3 or, or this verse here, in whom we have redemption through his blood. I'm redeemed, you say. I've been saved. Uh, my sins have been forgiven. The work of redemption has been complete because the Lord Jesus Christ has died on the cross for me and I've trusted in that. I am redeemed. I belong to him. And that's true. But look at verse 14 which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So just a minute, I have been redeemed, but verse 14 seems to say that I'm going to be redeemed. Is that true? Well, they're actually both true. They're not contradictions. And they're both true because of one of those wonderful features of redemption that we saw previously. The redemption has uh, these two aspects. We're redeemed from something and we're redeemed to something. And we saw that, didn't we, when we just considered briefly Exodus chapter 12, and we often think of that, and 
good biblical reason for thinking of that, in, in the setting of redemption, that the nation of Israel were purchased out of Egypt. But God didn't leave them in no man's land. They seemed at times to be determined to be left in no man's land right enough, but God didn't leave them in no man's land. He brought them out of Egypt, let my people go, that they may serve me, to bring them into the promised land. Uh, but in between those two, mainly because of their disobedience, there was that period of, of 40 years in the wilderness. And so they were brought out. Uh, so if you met them, for example, on that path in the wilderness and you were to ask God's people, are you redeemed? They could quite confidently say, yes, we are redeemed. Ephesians 1 and 7. Um, and if you were to ask them, well, are you going to your redemption? They could also say, yes, we are going to our redemption. Uh, because they're leaving something behind and they're going to something else. And those two aspects brought together are in fact our redemption. Uh, both the redemption that has been completed and the purpose of that redemption to which we're going. So God has bought you for a purpose. He's bought you for a purpose. So you can say from verse 7, I have been redeemed in whom we have redemption. And you can also say that one day I'm going to come into the fullness of the uh, experience of that. And the fullness of the benefit of that. I know what it is to leave behind, and in verse 14, one day we will know what it is to enter in, which is the earnest or the promise um, uh, of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Now, if you think of those two points, redemption to redemption, uh, have been redeemed and will be redeemed, if you think of those two points, the beginning of the Christian life and the end of the Christian life, then in the book of Ephesians, uh, we have the ministry of the Holy Spirit running from redemption to redemption, from being saved to entering into the fullness of it, from earth to heaven, uh, from time into eternity, and God has given us his Spirit for that particular ministry. Obviously, that is not the only ministry of the Holy Spirit, but that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit we have here in the book of Ephesians. You say, well, what kind of things does the Holy Spirit do? What kind of things, what kind of ministry does he have for the, for the Christian? Well, maybe, just very quickly, I'm going to go through them in, a, in maybe a kind of ordered way, just thinking about that from redemption to redemption. And let me just take you on a kind of whistle-stop Bible tour of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And there is a reason for doing this, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll see that in a minute. If you were to come with me, please, would you, uh, back maybe to Second Thessalonians, or forward even to Second Thessalonians, <clears throat> And chapter number two, and we're going to just work through these uh, slowly. Uh, I have um, not, I'm not going to say much about each one, but uh, I wanted just to try and build up the picture. And I think what, what I'm going to, what we're going to do here is just see the ministry of the Holy Spirit in a sense from the beginning of the Christian experience through to the end of the Christian experience. Just trace it systematically in that way. So that helps me to remember it. And maybe you can see the pattern developing as we're picking these verses. There'll be verses towards the end of the New Testament and verses towards the beginning. But we'll see it progressing, I hope, through the Christian life, uh, the way in which the Spirit of God touches each part of the Christian experience. So 2 Thessalonians 2 and... Uh, I'm in 2 Timothy, and that's not going to help me, is it? <laughs> 2 Thessalonians, Ephesians, chapter number 2 and verse number 13. Uh, verse 13, there it goes, there we go, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, I've written down there, uh, verse 13, yeah. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, all right? Now, that takes us to the very, very beginning of the Christian experience, so far as you and I are concerned. That the Spirit of God is operative at the very beginning of the salvation experience. In fact, even before we know that we're saved, even before we are saved, he has been working in such a way to bring us, at least in part, in contact with the gospel, but set us apart in other ways, bigger than that as well, actually, to bring us to the experience of salvation. So there's a work there, and we knew nothing about it. But perhaps in retrospect, as we can look back, and maybe we do that after we're saved, I hope we do do it, and we say, well, you know, maybe if these experiences hadn't been there, I would have never have been saved. And you say, well, 
God doesn't really work like that, does he? It's, it's not just a series of events, but maybe if we get a view of God as being bigger than the events, then we can see that he's even in control of those events. And so it's no, it's no chance, for example, as to where we were born or, or to whom we were born. It's no chance that maybe we received an invitation. It's no chance that maybe we received a leaflet or a tract. It's, it's no chance that we ended up at a, at a particular meeting at a particular time. And for some reason, that particular message that that preacher brought was, spoke to me in a particular way. And none of that's coincidence. And the Spirit of God is working there in the background, even before we come to faith in the Lord Jesus. So he's operative in salvation. And I could maybe just develop that a little. And if you were to flick back with me to John's Gospel, let me just to take it all, just a tiny step further than the, the moments, if you like, or the days or even the years leading up to your salvation. If you were to go to John's Gospel, chapter 16. Um, let me just show you the moment of salvation, if you wish. In John 16 and 8, the work of the Holy Spirit here. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment. So the day that you got saved, did you become aware of your sin? I'm, I'm sure you did. Well, that was the work of the Holy Spirit. The, the moment that you got saved, did you become aware that actually one day you were going to be judged? That's the righteousness of God. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. So right at the beginning, and even before the beginning of our salvation, I'm just going to call it salvation's work, uh, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, let me just take you a little step beyond that. You see, I'm, I'm saved now. Uh, in John chapter 16, not long after we're saved, the Spirit of God continues his work. And interestingly, in John 16, it seems to be the very next work that the Spirit of God does in the uh, life of the believer. Uh, look at verse 13 of John 16. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he'll show you things to come. And verse number 15, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and he'll show it to you a little while, and you shall not see me. So the first work of the Holy Spirit, salvation, leading up to and that moment of salvation. The next, the next work of the, the Spirit of God, the revelation of the Lord Jesus. The first thing that he has for you is the person of Christ. And we won't really make any progress if we, if we miss that. that that's, that's, that's pretty basic. We've got to know about Christ and we've got to appreciate Christ. And he's got to be supremely important to us. You remember the, the, the story of, uh, of the man of the Gadarenes? Do you remember that? That, that naked man running about to uh, self-harming in, in, uh, in, in the graveyard with, with demon, demons and, and, and so forth. And the Lord Jesus Christ casts out the demons and he's clothed and in his right mind and at the feet of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? First thing, his priority is the Lord Jesus. And you remember the story of Mary and Martha as well, don't you? As, he, as the Lord Jesus attends that home. And uh, uh, Martha, Martha, well, you know, you're really busy about all, all sorts of things. Mary has chosen that better part and she's down there listening to the Lord Jesus. And so we're saved. That's the first ministry of the Holy Spirit, revelation, revelation or salvation. And then the second ministry, the revelation of the person of the Lord Jesus. Now, quickly, just to flick over into 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Now, I know there's a lot of verses and... I've got uh, quite a few wee titles here, but hopefully we can see it making progress through uh, our uh, through our uh, Christian experience. First Corinthians chapter six and verse number eleven, speaking particularly, of course, about these believers in Corinth who had gone had, from, who had come from a background of significant immorality but of general application no doubt first corinthians 6 verse number 11 and such were some of you but you are washed but you are sanctified but you are justified in the name of the lord jesus and by the spirit of our god okay so the spirit of god begins his work in in, in the christian life at the point of salvation and then it's the revelation of the lord jesus he's going to teach you all about christ in He's going to give you an interest in Christ and feed you with Christ. And then sanctification. There's a lot of text in the Bible about that. I've just picked one. So that sanctification really means being set apart from the world and set apart to Christ, from the world and to Christ. And then let's go back to Romans. Romans 8, 26. 
you're making progress now in your Christian life. You've been saved. You've got a little appreciation of the Lord Jesus, something that the folks in the world really don't have, but you have it for some reason, work of the Spirit of God. You feel a burden to be set apart from the world and set apart to God. Sanctification, that's an unusual thing. That also is a work of the Spirit of God. And Romans 8, just to give you a flavour of where the Spirit is going to take you now, Romans 8, 26 Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He's going to bring us into the enjoyment of a relationship with God, exemplified here by prayer. And in fact, the relationship's bigger than that, but I'm just picking that one aspect of that relationship that he brings us into. It's a relationship with, of prayer. Or how about over into 2 Corinthians, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Corinthians, <clears throat> Second Corinthians and chapter number 3. So we're making progress through the Christian life, uh, relatively systematic progress, salvation obviously at the beginning, that's the work of the Spirit. But then there's an interest in the person of Christ, that's revelation, that also is the Spirit of God's work. Sanctification, set apart from the world and set apart uh, to God, that is a work of the Spirit. An enjoyment of the relationship that we have with the God in heaven, uh, that is the work of the Spirit. We have prayer, for example, as an example of that. And then through the experiences of life, through a reading of the Word of God here, particularly in 2 Corinthians 3, maybe just verse 17 to connect. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Transformation of your character. That is a work of the Spirit of God. That's right the way through your Christian life. As we read the Word of God, as the Spirit of God takes those words to change us and mould us, and in the next chapter as well, of course, of Second Corinthians, as we pass through the experiences of life, that too will be used by His Spirit uh, to uh, to transform us. First Corinthians chapter twelve. So we're really beginning to make a bit of progress, perhaps, in the Christian life. You see, I'm being saved. That's the work of the Spirit of God. We're enjoying something of the of the person of Christ. Revelation, that's the work of the Spirit of God. Sanctification, set apart and set to God. That is the work of the Spirit of God. I'm enjoying something of that living relationship with God. That is the work of the Spirit of God. My character is beginning to change. I'm different from what I was last year and three years ago and five years ago. That's the work of the Spirit of God. You haven't done that. Don't take any credit for it. It's a work of the Spirit of God. And you say, well, maybe, maybe... Maybe maybe God could use me to do something. Uh, maybe he'll, will he use your natural abilities? Well, he might use your natural abilities, but uh, he's going to do more than that. He's going to particularly gift you. And you know who gifts you? Do you know who it is that is responsible for that? Well, what about uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 1? Now, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. Uh, Verse number nine, to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles and so forth, all by, verse 11, by all these working one and the self same spirit. So if God's going to use you for his glory, if he's going to use you in the sharing or preaching of the word of God or teaching or with children to, to uh, help them, or if he's going to use you in pastoral care or, or guiding and, and shepherding the flock, whatever it might be, and, and many, many, many other gifts, that comes from the spirit of God. So there he is again. And what about the practicalities of life, the uh, character perhaps that would be displayed in, in our lives uh, day by day? Um, how, about to, well, how about Romans again? We'll go back to Romans, shall we? Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8 again. Romans chapter number 8, shall we? Uh, Romans chapter number 8, the Christian character. Uh, again, forum does we battle against the flesh and does the Spirit of God brings forth these fruit. You remember that from Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. But there in Romans 8 verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, but if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit 
do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Spiritual character and spiritual conduct are product of the Spirit of God. And finally, maybe that would take us to, eh, well, maybe not to the end, but to part and parcel of the ongoing work of uh, God in our lives. If you flick over to Ephesians chapter number 6, let me remind you too that in the great battles ongoing in the spiritual life, uh, of the believer that again we too are indebted to the Spirit of God in such a way. And there's a, an example of it there in Ephesians 6. Again, you'll find other examples in the Word of God, but I'm just choosing this one. Ephesians 6, uh, you remember that at the end from verse 10 on, you have this great armour that uh, belongs to the believer and uh, an essential part of that armour in the spiritual battles that we find, Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Again, we're indebted to the Holy Spirit uh, there uh, in this battle. So you, you, you followed that through, have you? You followed me through. I hope I haven't lost you completely. As we began at the beginning of the, the Christian life, and, and perhaps we've reached almost the end of the Christian life, and you say, well, at the beginning we've got salvation. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. And then there's the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And then there's the sanctification of the Christian. We're taken apart from the world and set apart to him. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And then there's that relationship that we enjoy uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with the God of heaven. That, too, is a work of the Holy Spirit. And then there's the consecration or transformation of Christian character. A work of the Holy Spirit. Gifts in the church, if you wish to serve, a work of the Holy Spirit. The transformation of character and the transformation of conduct, a work of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual warfare, a work of the Holy Spirit. Remembered all that? Maybe not. I've got it written down just in case I miss one out. If you did write that down, or if you did follow that, what you have is not only a systematic list or a systematic working through in the Christian life of the work of the Holy Spirit. But if you wrote all of that down, what you have is an outline of Ephesians. Right? Uh, from Ephesians chapter 1 through to Ephesians chapter 6, point by point, you have the work of the Holy Spirit in each of those dimensions. Let's, if you've got Ephesians before you, let's, let me just show you what I mean. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13 and you'll remember, of course, that Ephesians goes way back to the very beginning and, and then a bit, uh, right to be even before the beginning, uh, in the eternal purposes of God. Uh, the plan of salvation is traced back to in Ephesians, chosen in Christ be for the foundation of the world. So that's even before that text that, that we read about in Thessalonians, uh, where the Spirit sets us apart. Uh, that goes way back to the beginning of the work of salvation. But we break in verse number 13 there this evening uh, of Ephesians 1, in whom also, uh, in whom you also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed you were sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise. So the work of salvation in chapter number 1, the Spirit of God. And then what was next in that train uh, that we followed through the New Testament scriptures and his work? Well, it was the revelation of the Lord Jesus, wasn't it? That was the next thing. Lord Jesus himself puts it as the next work of the Holy Spirit in John 16. Well, if you're there in Ephesians 1, let me show you, Ephesians 1, 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's the next work of the Holy Spirit. So he saved you. Saved you for what? Saved you to do things? Well, yes, you, you will do things, there's no doubt. But saved you really for himself. That's ultimately his, his primary and, and eternal purpose. And right at the very beginning. Actually, you're not going to, we won't make any progress if we try and bypass Ephesians 1 and 17. If we try and skip the person of the Lord Jesus, we'll, we'll go off at a tremendously crazy tangent. We'll be going down paths of promising that God can do everything for you and he'll bless you in all sorts of ways and we miss the Lord Jesus Christ and we don't see that the core and heart of the Christian experience is Christ. If we think it's somehow to accumulate prosperity or blessings then and we miss that verse, we're, we're off at a complete tangent. 
So, uh, the second uh, part there is the work of the Spirit in the revelation of Christ. Now, what, what came next? Sanctification, wasn't it? Well, you've got that in Ephesians chapter 2. And you'll remember, there's verse 2, for example, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversations in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and whereby nature the children of wrath, even as, uh, as others. And as you go down through that uh, first ten verses there, you'll find that we're set apart from the world, the flesh and the devil, and we're set apart to Christ. The Spirit of God, by the way, isn't actually mentioned there, but nonetheless, that is his work, and that is the very next section in Ephesians. Relationship, yes, we have that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number uh, 11, uh, down through that section, you have the great work of relationship and prayer. Uh, look, for example, there, uh, verse number 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. He's broken down. Uh, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He's made of twain, one new man. Uh, verse 18, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Verse 22, in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So that, re that relationship, uh, particularly in prayer, of course, in that section, and that relationship also uh, in the church is the work of the Spirit of God. That was the next uh, of those steps in our understanding of the Spirit. So salvation, revelation, sanctification, relationship, and then, do you remember we saw that great truth of the transformation of our character, the transformation of the believer, uh, being moulded and shaped to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, well, we have that next, too, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses understanding, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That inner working of the Spirit of God transforming the believer into uh, the character, uh, to reflect the character of the Lord Jesus and bringing them into the deep things of God. And then, of course, character and conduct, that runs through chapters numbers 4 and 5, the, the gifts as well, of course, at the beginning there of chapter number 4, should just mention that. Uh, chapter number 4, verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led the captivity to captive, gave gifts unto men. So we have the gifts that the Spirit brings. And then as you go through uh, the next part of chapter 4 and into chapter 5, just very briefly, won't spend too much uh, time there, but just mentioning it, you'll see, for example, uh, that there is the battle against the flesh at the end there of chapter number 4. Uh, verse number 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, wherefore putting away lying and speak every man truth with his neighbour and so forth until you get to verse 9 of chapter 5, for the fruit of the spirit is all goodness, righteousness and truth. So he's bringing about that change in character, change in conduct, he's bringing forth the fruit of the spirit and finally, we get to the spiritual battle right at the end of Ephesians, Ephesians 6, where we read, of course, earlier on, Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 17, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so the ministry of the Spirit of God for the believer, as you work it through the New Testament Scriptures, as you, you begin with salvation and then the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as uh, Perhaps you progress a little to your understanding of sanctification. You appreciate that that brings you into a relationship with the God of heaven and uh, prayer, for example. Uh, you, you then get an appreciation that there is a work being done in you in the transformation of your inner person to reflect something of Christ. And there is the gifting of, the, uh, of, of everything that we need in order to serve him. There is the change in character and conduct. And then there is that great spiritual battle that we're involved with. All of that is a work of the Spirit of God. And point by point, as you go through the Ephesian letter, 
that forms, in a sense, the very, uh, the very structure of the Ephesian letter. Why? Why? Right. One final thought, just to share with you. If instead of trying to remember all of that, which is uh, not very practicable, if I was to suggest to you that instead of trying to remember that, if you were able perhaps to cut out a template from the Old Testament of the Bible, uh, maybe, do you remember the days when we used to have overhead projectors? Some of you are old enough to remember that. And uh, you used to have the acetates and people would draw things on them and they would put it on the overhead projector and you would see the picture on the, on the wall. And then they would maybe get another uh, another little picture that they would draw and they would put it on top of the, the, the first thing and you would see a, a double picture, two and one on top of one another. You can do it nowadays, of course, on computers. You can you can superimpose if you've got any of these uh, little programs that edits your photos. You can take your photo and you can you can put a you can put a funny set of ears or a funny nose on somebody and you can sort of superimpose on top of the picture. Well, let, let me suggest to you that we could do that with scripture, that we could take we could take a picture from the Old Testament and we could superimpose it on top of the Ephesian letter and we could see that the two, in fact, are very, very similar. I'm going to suggest to you that what you could do is take the life of Moses and just use that as a template and lay it on top of the Ephesian letter and what you would see is, in a sense, the life of Moses and Joshua at the end, the life of Moses, in, in effect, forming the structure of Ephesians. So it's it's a life that began with redemption, didn't it? Well, at one point, anyway, it begins with redemption in Exodus 12. As Moses and the people of God, nation of Israel, are brought out of Egypt, that's where Ephesians chapter 1 begins, begins with the redemption. And then, of course, it's uh, uh, an experience that brings them into, well, sanctification. They have to leave Egypt behind, and there's a great battle about that and on a number of occasions. Uh, they're going to leave Egypt behind, and they're going to be set apart to their God. And that was so much part and parcel of their journey through the wilderness. Of course, uh, as part and parcel of that journal, journey through the wilderness, they're going to build something, you remember, a place where they're going to come into a relationship with God. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us about building something so that we can enjoy a relationship with God. Ephesians 2.20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly, get, get the idea of building, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple to the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an inhabitation of God through the Spirit. So Moses and the nation of Israel, they were redeemed, they were brought out. There was really that sanctifying experience. I want you to leave Egypt behind. That wasn't an easy thing because sometimes I want you to hold on to Egypt and I want to bring you into the things of God. And to help in that, I'm going to build a place where we're going to meet together, a tabernacle or a temple in effect. And at the heart of that temple, I'm going to place something. I'm going to place the dimensions of divine love at the heart of that temple, that tabernacle. The dimensions of divine love, I'll give you the measurements for it. It's going to be the mercy seat. It's going to be the place of atonement. It's going to be the place which blood is going to be sprinkled so that man can come near. And within it, there's going to be the bread of life. And within it, there's going to be a picture of, of resurrection. And within it, there's going to be the law. But don't worry about the law because the blood will cover the demands of law. And there's going to be the dimensions of divine love at the very heart of that. And Ephesians chapter 3, of course, brings me to the dimensions of divine love. Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth and height. Going to know the dimensions of divine love. Ark of the Covenant, isn't it? And then the nation of Israel and Moses, of course, they're going to have this journey ahead of them. You'll read of it through, in a sense, Ephesians 4 and 5. There'll be a battle against the flesh, battle against Amalek. Well, that's what Ephesians 4 and 5 is all about. Battle against the flesh and coming out victorious. And then one day, after failure at the beginning of the book of Numbers, after failure to go in and possess the land, one day, as Joshua takes over and and uh, the first and second chapters of Joshua, the pages are turned, then they're going to be ready for that battle, to take the land and to enter into their inheritance. And that, of course, is where Ephesians ultimately leads us in chapter number six of Ephesians uh, to putting on that armour and being ready for that battle. Okay. 
maybe is that easier to remember? I hope that's easier to remember. Remember Moses. Remember the nation of Israel. They were redeemed. They were brought out. They were set apart and sanctified. They had a temple or a tabernacle to build and to meet with God in that temple and tabernacle. At the heart of it were the dimensions of divine love. There was a walk that they had to, they had to pass through in order to be victorious over the, over the flesh, over Amalek, and ultimately they would come into their inheritance. Now, why would there be such a pattern in Ephesians? Well, do you remember at the very beginning uh, when we thought about Ephesians chapter number 1 and we noticed that we had all these blessings in the Lord Jesus. Ephesians 1 and verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And you remember that we, we thought uh, uh, in that verse that Here's a verse that tells us that we've got these, this innumerable, this vast resource of blessings in Christ, but we've got a problem. It's in heaven. <laughs> oh dear. That's a way up there. And then we realise that whilst those blessings were in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ is in heaven. Okay. Uh, verse 6 of chapter 2. Uh, and we also appreciated that we are in Christ. Which means that those blessings, whilst they're in heaven... Well, Christ is in heaven and we're in Christ. And so we're able to tap into those blessings. That also, in a sense, is our inheritance. What is in heaven? And as you go through the Ephesian letter, we, we really see the, the, the picture, in, in a sense, being opened up. That the believer who has that inheritance in heaven is expected to claim it and expected to enjoy it. And it's not just for the future, but it's for us today to draw down. There'll be more for us, don't worry. You won't ever, you won't ever um, run out of the resources. Just remember the picture of Rebecca and, uh, and those uh, ten and a half shekels that she was given of gold. It was, it was £8,000 worth, but that was just uh, a couple of trinkets from, from the ten camels full. And the ten camels full were actually just a tiny portion of what Abraham actually had. So, so don't worry about drawing on it just now that you may not be enough left. And I don't be what of that. There's an, an, an immeasurable resource there for us. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to, first of all, guarantee that we're going to get through. It's a guarantee that we're going to get through. That was one of the great ministries of the unnamed servant. He guaranteed that Rebecca would get there from out of the Chaldees, from Haran, back to Canaan, uh, back to Isaac. He was the guarantor. He was going to be there with her and take her through. He wasn't just going to give her instructions and you go on with it. He was going to guarantee. And secondly, as you go through this Ephesian letter, you see not only does the Spirit of God guarantee that inheritance, uh, but the Spirit of God actually uh, uh, allows us, he, he gives us the grace to, 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 to tap into it. Everything that we need to enjoy it is provided for us in, in the Spirit of God. And thirdly, that structure of the Ephesian letter reminds me that Without God's help, without the Spirit of God's help, my Christian life would be a failure. We're utterly dependent upon him every step of the way. From salvation, and I'm sure we all recognise that we're dependent upon God for salvation. But maybe sometimes in the Christian life it creeps into our minds that, well, maybe we don't need him now. We can kind of, we can, uh, we can uh, go, we can uh, free wheel from now on. You know, we, 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 uh, I remember it was Arthur Gooding many years ago said to me, um, Arthur Gooding uh, it was, was really quite a remarkable preacher uh, in his day a number of years ago. And I remember him saying to me, as, as I started to do a little bit of preaching all of those years ago, he said to me, Stuart, the most dangerous time, he says, is after you start to speak and the thought comes into your mind, I can do this. He says, that's a very dangerous place to be. You must always be dependent upon God. And sometimes that does happen. We, 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 we feel we can do this. We've done it before, so we can do it again. Maybe we can even repeat it. Maybe we can photocopy it. I don't know. You know and, and we become non-dependent upon God. And, and one of the basic lessons, of course, as you work through the Ephesian letter, from the beginning of my Christian life to the end of my Christian life, is total dependence upon the Spirit of God. Okay, that's a basic lesson, very simple lesson to remember. And that Spirit of God guarantees me that I will enter into that inheritance. And the Spirit of God is there bringing me into the enjoyment of that experience. And a final lesson 
can we maybe just see on the surface here of Ephesians? Maybe our final lessons are easier than the details that we gave earlier on. But perhaps the final lesson in the Ephesian letter is that there's no shortcuts in the Christian life. You see, maybe I would quite like to have a little link from Ephesians 1 directly to Ephesians 6. Maybe like that bypass we've got round about Cumnock. You know, if you want to go to Kilmarnock, you don't have to go through Cumnock anymore, but there's a wee bypass, a wee ski slope, I think they call it, right? A wee bypass, and, and you, can get, you, can get, you can get to Kilmarnock quicker. And maybe in my Christian life, I, I would quite like a little bypass from Ephesians 1. I get saved to I win the victory in the battles in Ephesians 6. That would be better, wouldn't it? But that's not the way it works. There's, there's not going to be that victory in the battle by the grace of the Holy Spirit unless there's really an appreciation of the Lord Jesus. That came, comes first. Unless there's that sanctification in our life. Well, that comes next. Unless there's that living experience and relationship with God. Fundamental. We're, we're just... We're going to be cannon fodder if we jump from professing faith in the Lord Jesus with no interest in Christ and an unsanctified life, not in a living relationship with, with God in a practicable way, and then we, 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 we try and take on a battle. We're just going to be cannon fodder, absolute cannon fodder. And so the Ephesian epistle not only guarantees us an inheritance and, and provides uh, for that inheritance and the help of the Holy Spirit, but also perhaps shows us this great truth that uh, there is, in the Christian life, order and an expectation that ever before we win, win victory in the Christian life, that we will be marked by these wonderful experiences of the Spirit of God in sanctification, in relationship with him, and in an enjoyment of the Lord Jesus. And that's just there in the structure of this lovely epistle. Let's pray. Our Father, we do come into thy presence. We've thought to... Uh, uh, much uh, about the gracious work of thy Holy Spirit. Uh, his work is so varied and his ministry is so extensive it uh, perhaps overwhelms us at times just how vast a ministry thy Spirit has in our hearts and our lives in this world. But we pray, Father, that perhaps some of these simple thoughts we would be able just to uh, recall and remember that they might be of use and blessing and encouragement to us. We thank thee that thy spirit is there as the guarantor from redemption to redemption, from heaven, uh, from earth to heaven, from time into eternity. He's there to guarantee our passage, just as the unnamed servant did. We thank thee, our Father, that he's there as, uh, as that help, as the Saviour promised that he would be, that comforter, that one that draws alongside the paraclete, the, the alongside helper, the one Father, that in each step of the path is there for us. We're, we're not expected to go it alone or do it alone, but thy Holy Spirit is there uh, in empowering that sanctification, revealing the person of the Lord Jesus, bringing us into the experience of that living relationship with thyself, moulding and shaping our character and guiding our walk and giving victory in battle. And how we thank you, our Father, that the a life that we've been brought into is a life in which there is this tremendous appreciation and enjoyment of thy son. Help us to enjoy him day by day and to live in the in the joy of that relationship. Set apart our father.